Could you turn, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 22? And we'll be going from verse 9 this morning, so you'll need to keep your finger there. But from Deuteronomy 22, verse 9, all the way through to 23, verse 18, which we won't finish today. We'll, we'll have to go into next week. But you could title that, You Shall Not Commit Adultery. But these commandments teach us various things about marriage and what God desires for marriage. Um, and some of the key concepts that come through to me are separation, sanctification, faithfulness, and godly fruit. Um, while you, you hold your finger in Deuteronomy 22, can you please turn to Malachi? Malachi chapter 2 and verses 13 to 16. This is when Israel have come back into the land after being in exile and they've built the temple and God's got grievances with them and one of the grievances is this. Malachi chapter 2 verses 13 to 16. This is one of the grievances God has with his people and it's divorce. And so he says in verse 13, this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of Yahweh with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or receives it as acceptable from your hand. But you say, for what reason? Because Yahweh has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so, even one who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly seed? Be careful then to keep your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says Yahweh, the God of Israel. So verse 15 might be different in your translation, and the reason is it's a very difficult verse to translate. The Hebrew is a little bit obscure. But literally it says, and not one did, and keeping his spirit. Um, and what did the one do, or what did the one seek? A godly seed. What it's basically saying is, as the way I read it, is lots of people were divorcing their wives. And God's saying, don't come and worship to me when you're so treacherous with your marriage covenant. And he's saying here in verse 15, but the one who didn't do that, the, the, the single person who did not do that, is the one who has a remnant of spirit. In other words, he's spiritually, there's something spiritually alive about the person. And the reason he didn't do that is this. He was seeking a godly seed. And that really encapsulates one of the main purposes of marriage. That marriage should be to create the environment where godly seed is grown. And that's why marriage, God treats it as really important. Remember in the garden, right at the beginning, what did God say to Adam and Eve? He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That children being raised in a godly environment is one of the biggest um, purposes God created marriage for. It's not the main one, but it's one of them. It's right up there. And so in Deuteronomy 22, we see that God is wanting godly marriages. That's the first thing you can say. If you want godly seed, you need a godly marriage. Secondly, God wants them to follow his procedure of marriage. Biblically, when a person got married, firstly, they got betrothed, which is an engagement, but it's more than an engagement. It's a legally binding engagement. In other words, if you, like um, Jed, you were seeking um, Jenna, if you did it biblically, 
what you would have done personally, I'm not saying biblically for you, I'm just saying in the biblical time, you would have gone to the parents and you would have paid a bridal price and if um, Jenna agreed at that time, you would have agreed to get married and you would have had witnesses and it would have been legal. Between the time you got engaged and the time you actually got married, to break that off, you would have had to have gotten a divorce. And we don't have that in our culture. But think of it in terms of our relationship with the Lord. Christ has paid the bridal price. What did he pay? Not 11 cows, but his own blood. So he has bought us. And therefore, we are, as collectively, the bride of Christ even now. But the wedding hasn't happened yet. We're still waiting for the marriage feast. And so that's what would happen. Firstly, it would be legal there'd be a betrothal, and then it would be a, there'd be a public ceremony. The man would come to collect his wife, and then they would have the ceremony with witnesses. And then after that is consummation. And the, and the concept that Jewish people had is that the Holy Spirit would be, just like at creation, the Spirit hovered over the waters, so the Spirit would hover over the marriage bed, and they were looking for seed, for fruit from the marriage. And so when you get married, there's a reality where you are sanctifying yourself to the other person and you're sanctifying, and that person is sanctifying you to them. It, and we do this in our English vows. If you take the traditional vows, the, the minister will say, forsaking all others, will you keep yourself only for the, per, the other person as long as you both shall live? That's called sanctification. Sanctification is a separation. It means that that person is no longer belonging in that camp, but they're belonging in a new camp. There's a new creation in marriage, and the creation is this couple who has this oneness together. It's pretty basic, but we don't live in a society that believes that. We, believe, we live in a society that believes marriage is a contract. If it doesn't suit you anymore, then just give a month's notice, and then that's it, move on. Even our marriage counselors in the world counseled that. If you're unhappy, try and work it out. But if you can't work it out, rather divorce than stay in a miserable marriage. That's what they will say. That's not scriptural. Scriptural marriage is a one flesh union, which is in the context of a covenant. And the covenant's not just the fact that you had a, a sexual relationship with each other, that's not covenant. Covenant is before witnesses, you are binding yourself to the other person. And because of those witnesses, therefore, the only thing that terminates that is death. If you committed adultery in biblical times, it wasn't divorce that ended the marriage. It was death. You were supposed to be stoned to death. And so you sanctify each other and after that ceremony then you're supposed to have the one flesh union that is god's design therefore cohabitation just living together is not marriage i i remember one person in prayer said to me you know our marriage is our, our relationship we live together is good as marriage so we don't need to get married you know i don't want to get married and i said to her doesn't the fact that you don't want to get married indicate that you're not married? If you listen carefully to what people say, people make contradictions like that. They'll say, ah, we're just as good as married, but I don't want to get married. Well, then you're not married. You just confessed that you don't want to get married. Now, in their minds, they have a different understanding of what those words mean, but they've just confessed it nonetheless. You see, when you covenant together, you make an agreement that you will perform what God wants you to perform as a godly man, as a godly woman. And God is the ultimate witness to the marriage, you know? The basic things that you need for a marriage is a man, a woman, and a binding agreement and witnesses. Those are the basic elements. And that's why in biblical times, and even today, if you go to the Zulu culture, if you get married, who turns up to your wedding? Practically the whole community. That's the way it kind of happened in the Bible time. You didn't send invites out. People just from the community rocked up. Everybody was to know that this man belongs to this woman and this woman belongs to this man. 
So as we read through this, let's bear those things in mind. Firstly, let's read verses 9 to 12, and I title this part, Pictures of Biblical Marriage. Pictures of Biblical Marriage, or actually it's the opposite. Pictures of what marriage is not supposed to be, really. And it's to do with three illicit mixtures. So let's read. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest all the produce of the seed which you have sown and the increase of your vineyard become defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a material mixed of wool and flax together. You shall make for yourself tassels on the four corners of your garment with which you cover yourself. Now, you're probably thinking as you're reading that, what's this got to do with marriage? These are very, very like strangely put together um, commandments that don't even mention marriage or sexual relationships. But if you break it down and you read it in that context, you actually see these pictures come through. Firstly, we have the vineyard. The vineyard is not to be sown with two kinds of seed. What could that have to say about marriage? Well, let's turn to Song of Songs. Song of Songs, verse 8. And we're going to read from verse 11 and verse 12. Now, just to give you a context, this is a love song. Song of Songs is a love song between Solomon and his bride-to-be. And it's a real love song. It's about real marital love. It's not simply an allegory of something else. It was about Solomon. You can learn lessons from this in terms of your marriage and um, wanting to get married to someone. But marriage is always a picture of God's relationship with his people. And so in a very real way, it also pictures Christ and the church. And in verse 11, it says, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon, and he gave the vineyard to caretakers. Each one was to bring 1,000 shekels of silver for its fruit. So these caretakers, these people who were to look after the vineyard, these people, they were expected to bring a huge amount of fruit from it. Now that vineyard was probably the place where um, Solomon was told about his wife, you know, his wife-to-be, the Shulamite. She was there. But look what she says in verse 12. My very own vineyard is before me. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and 200 for those who take care of its fruit. When you read the commentators, you'll see that they will portray this vineyard as being her body. In other words, often in the Song of Solomon, there are like pictures of fertility and pictures of um, nature and pictures of cultivation and gardening that speak of the marital love. That she actually says, if you just hold your finger there and go to chapter um, 5, verse 1, this is the man and his bride. Solomon's taking, taking her already as his wife. And it's, he says to her, I have come into my garden my sister, my bride. I have picked my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and imbibe deeply, O lovers. Solomon's calling her a garden. And the idea is the, the man is putting his seed in the garden. It's marital love, and it's within the context of the covenant of marriage. So back in chapter 8, verse 12, when she's saying, my own vineyard is before me, she's talking of herself. The vineyard belongs to her. In other words, if you look at verses 8 to verse 10, you'll see that her brothers had kept her chaste for the day of her marriage. They said, we have a little sister, she has no breasts, What shall we do for our sister on the day when she's spoken for? In other words, she must develop and become um, of age and um, of physical maturity in order to enter the marriage. And it says, 
If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will barricade her with planks of cedar. And she says, I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. What she's saying is, because of my brothers helping me, I have kept myself for my husband. Here you are, Solomon. This is my vineyard, and it belongs to you and you alone. So you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 22. In verse 9, it says, you shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seeds. What is it saying? That vineyard belongs to one kind of seed. It's not to be sown with two kinds of seed. That there's an exclusivity of marriage that it belongs, that woman belongs to that man and nobody else. Secondly, It says in verse 10, You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not plow an ox and a donkey together. The teaching is there shouldn't be unequal yoking here. Normally, what you would have is an ox uh, yoked with an ox, but the one ox would be older and the other ox would be younger. And the younger ox would be full of zeal. They want to run, but the older ox has the experience to know what is the right pace to go at to have the longevity. And so the older ox ends up training the younger ox. That's the principle of discipleship right there. We watched a a film about Chuck Smith who started Calvary Chapel. And there was a guy, a young guy, who was in the church who was from the hippie generation. And there was a big problem with this guy. This guy brought the people in. But he was this charismatic guy, not just in personality. He was very charismatic as a person. But he was also charismatic in expression. And he started doing things in the church. Someone fell over, um, so-called slain in the spirit. He would just jump up and say, God's telling me that someone needs to be healed. And he would not listen to correction. Chuck Smith was strong in the word of God. And Chuck Smith ended up turning around to him and telling him, sit down. And he would not listen to correction. You know what happened to Lonnie Smith? He left Calvary Chapel. He ended up meeting up with a man called John Wimber. And John Wimber saw the work that he was doing And he's like, we've got to use this guy. And John Wimber would do the teaching and this guy would do the ministry. And in comes Toronto. The whole laughing revival, drunken in the spirit thing came through Lonnie Frisbee. Lonnie Frisbee was involved in hectic sexual sin. He he confessed to um, to John Wimber. He'd been involved with a young guy for so many months. Homosexuality. Apparently on his deathbed, He made a confession, we renounced the sin, repented, but what devastation he did to the body. How it would have been different if Lonnie had embraced correction from an older ox, if he'd have repented, if um, Chuck Smith was able to tell him, this is not biblical, what you were doing, but there was just the pride, the pride of I'm going to be a minister and God's going to use me greatly. It doesn't matter how gifted you are or how well used you are. What God is looking for is faithfulness. Faithfulness to his word and faithfulness to godly authority. And so what happens is the ox is supposed to be yoked with an ox. Now we see this in the New Testament. This teaching If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Two Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 onwards. Very much like Lonnie Frisbee, I believe God worked despite him in, in people's lives. But Lonnie Frisbee was operating in a different spirit. I'm I'm convinced of it. 
God worked despite him. My friend, my friend Pumalani, he came out of ancestors, got saved through reading the Bible, dropped ancestors through Jehovah's Witness literature. God worked despite the Jehovah's Witnesses. Does that mean we go around brandishing, like giving out Jehovah's Witness literature because God worked despite it? No. God works despite things, but Scripture is very clear, do not be unequally yoked. And in the context of here, these are false apostles who were in the church of Corinth. And he's telling them, like, why are you cutting us out? You should be cut, cutting them out. He actually says that in verses 11 to 13. Like, don't be restrained to us. Like, we, our heart is open to you. And in verse 14, he says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has a sanctuary of God with idols? These false teachers are saying, you can go to the temple, eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and get involved in all that religious festivity. God understands. God forgives. God no, Paul is actually saying these so-called apostles, they're false teachers. They are unbelievers in his estimation, and therefore you shouldn't be yoked in fellowship with such people. He says, for we are a sanctuary of the living God, in verse 16, he continues saying, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What the Lord is saying here is your intimacy with me depends on you being separated from them. If you think about that, your intimacy with the Lord, my intimacy with the Lord, depends on being separated from false brethren. When I say false brethren, these false brethren are not just people who say they're Christians. These are people who are teaching. It's on another level. The new person who comes in off the street is a different matter. But these people are influences in the body of Christ, leading people to idolatry. And so Paul is saying, you, if you want to be close to God, be separate to them. But it's a principle. It doesn't just apply to fellowship. It applies to marriage. Do not be unequally yoked. An ox is a clean animal. It's a kosher animal. A donkey is not kosher. Why is the donkey not kosher? Because it chews the cud, but it doesn't have a split hoof. So you've got a clean animal, a kosher animal, plowing together and yoked together with an unclean animal. In the context of marriage, what does it teach us? It teaches us believers, born-again believers, are only to marry born-again believers. It is so serious. God teaching this to Israel was so serious that when they took pagans as their wives at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, God actually commanded divorce, and he hates divorce. God hates divorce, and yet in the situation, when they had these pagan wives with their pagan ways, and, and Ezra's so upset, he tears out his hair. He's that, like, guys... It was the idolatry that led us into exile in the first place. And now you're entertaining it. You're going to bring us into exile again. That's Ezra's mindset. And he's like saying, no, put away your wives and their children. And you think, how terrible to put these women away and their children. How can you do that? The problem's not putting them away. The problem is they took them as wives in the first place. Now, in the New Testament, we read in 1 Corinthians 7, if you, get, if you are in a relationship with someone who's unsaved and you get born again, if that unbeliever is willing to live with you in your Christian ways, you stay with them. 
Because in the New Testament, because of Christ, the believer sanctifies the unbeliever. But that doesn't apply if you're a Christian and you were like, oh, I want to find someone to marry. It doesn't apply. And we'll see that come out later. But the third thing here, and it says in verse 11, you shall not wear a material mixed of wool and flax together. That's a difficult one to understand. But the word here is a Hebrew word for mixed material. It's, um, it's sha'atnez, but it's not actually originally Hebrew. It's actually originally Egyptian. So because it's an Egyptian word that was, became a Hebrew word, people think this was an Egyptian practice. Other people think this kind of garment was the kind of garment that prostitutes would wear. That's another viewpoint. A third viewpoint, and this is in a book called um, Da'at's Ganim, which is Knowledge of the Elders. It actually, it, they actually say the linen would have been mixed with wool dyed blue, like the curtain of the Holy of Holies. So if you look at it, they take the, the wool dyed blue and the linen, and they're spinning it together to make this, this, this yarn of two mixed materials. So what they're saying is, this curtain is sacred to God. The incense that was made to God is sacred to God. It's been sanctified to God. And the things that have been sanctified to God, you shouldn't be using on yourself. It belongs to God. For me, it's very difficult to know which one is the right one. But if you look at it, it's still the same principle as the first two, as the vineyard and as the ox and the donkey. Really, God's people should be joined with believers. God's people should be joined with God's people. Now, let's bring that down into the practical. Because I don't know about you, but in my late 20s, and I was looking for love in all the wrong places, as they say. <laughs> they weren't the wrong places with believers, but I was in the flesh. And I caused huge issues with friends and fellowship and just because of my own, my own fear. Because you hit a certain age and you're like, I don't want to be single for the rest of my life. And so what do you do? You either handle that in the spirit or you handle that in the flesh. And so what are you facing? You're facing what you would like, and Jed mentioned it this morning, the thing that would make you happy, or you're you facing holding true to God's word. And you've got a choice to make. You either allow the word of God to have preeminence, or you go with your feelings. And there are untold people who have gone with their feelings who, when later they really wanted to press in with the Lord and their spouse didn't, they don't want anything to do with the Lord, what strife that causes in the, in the relationship. What difficulty it causes, because you can't, especially if you're the woman in the family. I've, I've known women who were married to unbelievers and they have to rush home straight after the meeting. Otherwise, their husbands will not be happy. You know, the, the fellowship becomes limited because they're trying to please their husbands, and yet they're trying to please the Lord. It's far, far, far more difficult. If you look at this last line here in verse 12, it says, You shall make tassels on the four corners of your garment with which you cover yourself. Now, why would they make tassels on the corners of the garment? We have looked at this before, but just as a reminder, you can write the scripture down. Numbers 15. Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 to 41. Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41. You put the tassels on the corners of your garment to remind you of the commandments of God's law. I think of the woman who had the issue of blood, and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. She was likely touched, because Jesus followed the law, he was law observant. She was likely touching that part of the garment that represented the word of God. And it was in that place that represented the word of God she found her healing and salvation. Isn't that an, an amazing picture? He's basically saying you are to be under 
the authority of that which represents the Word of God. And there are so many times in life we have decisions to make. And um, there's a, a pathway that's easy, that's lucrative, that will suit us better, that will do good things in our lives, make us happy, whatever, and then there is God's way. And sometimes those things align and sometimes they don't. And it's in the, in the, the place where they do not align when they are in conflict that you have to make the decision, do I go with my happiness or do I go with the Word of God? Marriage is one of those big things. I feel for people who are single and they're older. When I was, I can't remember whether it was, I was 28 or 29, and I got to that place and I thought, it's never going to work out. I felt like I was 40 <laughs> at the time. I felt like, that's it, it's over. And, and it's amazing when you give up what you want, because I had these little two bottles I was keeping for my wedding and, and my marriage, and I just poured them out. To the, I, I did a drink offering. I had to. Uh, mentally, I was, like, you can ask Di later. Mentally, I was not right. And I had to pour it out, and I said, Lord, I can't. And in the end, the Lord said, now I can work with you. Turn your head. Look. <laughs> Turn your head. Look. You're looking in the wrong place. The Lord knew better than me. And I am so grateful that the Lord didn't give me what I thought I wanted at the time. The Lord it doesn't do these things because he hates us. He loves us. And there's certain people that God wants single. And why? Because he's going to use them in extraordinary ways. In ways he could not use them if they were married. And that gift that that person has is a gift. And your spouse, if you are married, is a gift. Either way, it's a gift, but make sure whatever gift you have is under the authority of God's Word. Otherwise, how are you going to raise godly seed in an ungodly marriage? How, and when I say seed, I mean, Di and I don't have children. I mean, we tried twice to adopt, but because we don't have a green ID, they were like, no, you'd have to go overseas, go through a, 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 an agency from overseas, an adoption agency, to South Africa, then visit South Africa numerous times, and then you would basically be able to adopt. But it even applies to spiritual children. It's much easier, I know, counseling or, or, or working through with a couple that is getting married, so much easier to do it with Di than just to do it by myself. Because Di can give perspective for the, the women that I can't give in the same way. And those of you who are parents and you brought your children up in godly ways as a couple, because you're both born again, loving the Lord, following the word of God, you can counsel other couples in terms of child rearing. You can be the older ox with the younger ox couple. You see, this is what God is wanting for his people. I won't go on to the next section. I'll leave it for next week, but... God is wanting godly fruit. And that works physically. It works spiritually in terms of discipling people. But if the house is not godly, how are the children going to be godly? If, I haven't, if I'm not walking with the Lord myself, how am I going to disciple somebody else to walk with the Lord? What does he say in Matthew 20, 28? teaching, make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it says, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. When Jesus leads, he leads from the front. He walks ahead, and the sheep hear his voice and they follow him. He doesn't lead from behind just shouting orders. He walks the walk in front of them. That's why we need older brothers in the faith. We need each other because we don't have it all together. We're not necessarily following the Lord in every area of our life. We need the input of one another in our lives. But God really does want to use you in the lives of other people. And, and it disturbs me, the idea that people might think, I've got a church that I can belong to so I can belong to a church. And I was speaking to Jed and Chris about this the other week, and I thought, 
If that is what KFEF is about, if that's what our church is about, just providing a place that someone can belong to, we are falling way far short of what God has called us to be as a fellowship. Because what God has called us to be has to be in line with Ephesians 4. And what is Ephesians 4 speaking about? It talks about, let's turn to it. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. When Jesus ascended on high, when he went up to heaven, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to men. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. These are the gifts that God, that Jesus has given to the church. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. God has given ministries to the church to equip the saints for works of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Jump down to verse 16. Speaking the truth in love, we grow up into Christ. And it says, from whom, that's from Christ, the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies according to the properly measured working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. How is this church going to grow? Through the love service that each of us give to one another. Because you can't build anything up without love. You can tear down without love. Like, you don't need love to tear down a building. Like, you can just go ahead with a big, big wrecking ball and just smash the thing to pieces. You know, when you're dealing with false teaching, you don't need a very godly person to attack false teaching. That you can just get a Rottweiler and let him loose. You know, take, take that person down. But you can't build that way. You can't build a marriage without love. You can't build a family without love. You cannot build a school without love. You can't build a community without love. And it to be the glory that God wants it to be. You can't do it. It's through that love service, each of us have a part to play. Not not everything rests on the shoulders of one person. We all have different giftings. We all have different ministries. We all have different participations. But may it be in a godly community. Because if the community is not godly, then the seed that is sown is ungodly seed. And the fruit that comes out of that seed becomes ungodly fruit. It's a principle that each of us can take to heart. Who is sufficient for such things? Not me. And not you. Not one of us can do that. It has to be the working of the Lord in us and through us. Dave Hunt put it so well. He said, the work of God in us may be at least as valuable as the work he does through us. If you've got, you've got people who are so gifted, they can stand up and they can speak and huge crowds can come in and they can even respond to the message. Lonnie Frisbee was one of them. But what is the fruit that comes from ungodly sowing? It's ungodly fruit. We need purity. That's why, you know, we, we, nobody's forced to be a member of the church. But the criteria of membership is you're born again you're saved, you have a testimony of salvation, you're baptized. 
and you agree with the statement of faith. Because if you have a whole bunch of people who, are, according to the Constitution, can vote to amend the statement of faith in an unbiblical way, if the whole membership was made up of ungodly people or people who are unbiblical, there are implications for that. So it is with your family, so it is with your marriage. If you know, I mean, praise the Lord, the work that he did in your lives, that you, when you married, you were marrying equally yoked. Praise the Lord, because two years ago, it wouldn't have been the case. God is good, and he did that in your lives because he wants the best for you. And not just because he wants the best for you, but I really believe if you graft into him and you really walk with him, he's going to use you in the future as servants of the Lord. That's what our marriages are for. So that we may serve the Lord together. Lastly, have you ever read the book Pilgrim Progress? Do you know there's two stories in the book Pilgrim's Progress? The, the story of Christian, and he gets saved, and he's heading to the celestial city. Who is his mentor? He doesn't have one, really. He has different people along the way, but there's no one that walks that way all the way through him. He picks up, he has a friend at one point, but he has to do it alone. But then you have another person, his wife, Christiana, and the second story is about her. She gets saved. How does she make her way to the, the celestial city? She has a co-pilgrim, a guide, walking with her all along the way, if you remember that story. I think of Di as my co-pilgrim on our way to the celestial city. You can take nothing with you. Your bank account your possessions, your car, your house, you can't take that with you. There's nothing you can take with you. But if your spouse is born again and saved, guess what? You get to take them with you to the celestial city. So um, let's pray.